thank you again, Jesse and Nanako, for, for doing this. It's such a pleasure for me to talk with you again, this time in the context of uh, the Institute of Architecture, that is this new space for research and education in architecture that we are starting to, to pull off a couple of years ago. And uh, it's great to have you. So thank you for taking the time and doing this. Um, well, um, I'm going to start uh, with uh, a little introduction of you too. So um, the first time we we talk was uh, a couple of years ago where you presented a lecture about uh, your work. And um, from there, it emerged a beautiful article in English uh, that you can find in uh, Rural Architecture's uh, website under the title, Looking Forward to Look Back. And in Spanish, uh, we uh, produce a book called Projective Theories. Um, that is also that text feature, but in Spanish. And this text uh, goes through the work of the office uh, in, in a chronological way, reconstructing some of the ideas and moments that fueled the projects uh, developed for more than 30 years. So today I would like to propose a different approach. Um, I will try to engage in a conversation regarding some of the ideas, techniques, and concepts behind the work, trying to reconstruct uh, not necessarily a linear history of your practice, but, well, let me first introduce you to Jesse and Nanako. Well, Reiser Umemoto, as you know, is an office of architecture that was at the center of what we might call the digital turn, and more specifically, at the global epicenter of much of these events, which was Columbia University during the 1990s. And for some years, Jesse Reiser and Nana Kumemoto were in close relationship with young and promising figures like Stan Allen, Greg Lean, Sanford Quinter, among many others, that interestingly departed to very different approaches to the problem of the digital in architecture for their practices. Jesse and Nanako were, from my point of view, one of the most interesting and consistent practices emergent from that place and moment in time, always in the search for alternatives to new ways of engaging with the new contemporary problems on technique and theory, both in the terrain of the architectural competition and in academia. Their practice is still being written testament for new generations to keep digging into ways to interrogate the discipline of architecture through the project. Taking in consideration genealogy, lineage, and history of the discipline, their practice allows for a deep understanding and complexification of reality in many ways. Without giving up on elegance, their designs combine uh, continuous forms, disruptions, exaggerations, disproportions, and mon monumentality, always transforming the context where they are implemented. The office projects result in milestones that instantly become architectural references for all times. So uh, this 2023 winter festival in the Institute, we're trying to rethink the problem of monstrosity in architecture. Monstrosity thought as a combination of both classical precepts and sublime effects uh, on design. I cannot think of a better practice than Jesse's and Nanako's to help us understand the riches for an architecture that exceeds the local and circumstantial towards transcendence in this sense. So thank you again, Jesse and Nanako, for doing this. You're very welcome uh, to this space of the Institute. And um, I wanted to let our audience in YouTube that can of course, uh, post comments in the in the chat, um, and I will try to read them if you like. To if you have any questions for for Shesi and Nanako uh, after our conversations, I will gladly read them to to them. So, without further ado, I'm going to start with the first question. This is like a general question in order to to start talking. Um, 
I would like to ask you what what is that you're working on uh, at the moment? Uh, is there a, a competition you're working on? A new uh, uh, project? Uh, you're working on a on a new book after um, projects under consequences? Um, oh, three actually. Um, uh, first, I just wanted to thank you for inviting us and including us in the uh, Institute's discussion. It's really you know, a pleasure. We've had long, you know, of course, history with you and of course, and as well with um, friends in Argentina uh, who have been you know, really in many ways formative for us. So um, we're really glad, you know, to, to be a part of this. Um, but in, yeah, um, partial answer to your question, I think, we're juggling a number of uh, you know, projects. Um, there will be a house that we're going to be designing in in Japan, in Hokkaido, for a client. So that's sort of uh, just about to start. Uh, as well, an interesting collaboration uh, on a competition for a, a entertainment and cultural center. Uh, in China with Wolf Pricks. And yes, we're continuing uh, to develop sort of past the book projects and their consequences. I mean, actually, we're reformatting even projects and their consequences to be a small book, which will be a pocketbook. Uh, because, yeah, I, I, purely for marketing purposes, I think people enjoyed the Atlas, it was a portable thing and it would get to a wider audience. So we're working uh, you know, in the office and also with Philip Denny um, on a series of volumes. So the, the projects and their consequences uh, became three volumes already simply because we had to condense things. So yeah, we're juggling a number of things at once. Also uh, the opening of the Kaohsiung port terminal, uh, which they're doing the final work on. Uh, there was a pre-opening in March, uh, but they're doing the final work on the interior of the tower. And so that should um, open and we'll start to publish images and materials on that. So yeah, a lot of stuff going on at once. I would like to ask you about the these uh, volumes that you are uh, is it like it's kind of a reduction of the or, or like a partition of the book or you're developing uh, something different yeah i mean we're you know both reformatting it with the same material but also gives us the opportunity to uh, add and then to update the material because um by reformatting the book to a smaller size uh it, it made one volume you know, ridiculously long, like 600 pages, it would be like a block. Uh, and so it, uh, for practical, but also thematic reasons, we chopped it up into smaller volumes and we're gonna be adding more materials. In a way, it's also a revisiting of, of work, of speculative work that doesn't easily fit into the categories we kind of put in the atlas or in you know projects. So there's a whole a new little book called Chambers that would include the flux room. It would include stage set design, uh, other speculative work that's more sort of a little way outside of the strictly building projects. That's fantastic. Okay, you can wait then. Um... Well, uh, and you are still teaching, right? Uh, yeah, you're, as far you're as I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Still teaching at Princeton, and Nanika will be. Uh, well, she. I have been teaching at uh, Wash Wash U in St. Louis, and then several other schools. But the, since last summer, I took off the teaching because I I I really I had the surgery. But I will start teaching again from the uh, January. Okay, that, that's a lot of things. I don't know how you managed to do all that. So, <laughs> well, uh, happy to know uh, you are very, very active. Um, okay, then um, I would like then to start with a question uh, regarding your work. Um, 
that has to do with uh, your first collaboration together. Mm -hmm. This is the this is the the Villa Farseri um, that you have published in your in your web. Uh, this is a project from 1984, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah. And uh, I find that there is some sort of a, a narrative technique uh, that you briefly talked about in, in other presentations that you did. Uh, can you elaborate on this idea of, this, uh, of the narrative project? And is this technique uh, present today uh, in, in the work that you are doing? Um. Well, yes, the, the, this technique has re-entered our work, I would say, in an interesting way. You know, currently, I'll get into that in a moment, but um, you, uh, as a kind of background, you know, this was a, um, this was a contribution to the uh, Venice Biennale that uh, Aldo Rossi uh, directed. And so, uh, the way he did it, it was, it was, first of all, an open Biennale. Anyone could contribute. He did ask us to, uh, you know, submit work for it, but, for it, but it was an open Biennale. It was uh, explicitly related to um, projects that existed as texts. So there's an actual site, of course, for the Villa Farsetti in the Veneto. But what really made it stand out for him was the, um, the written history of the garden of the Villa Farsetti. So it, 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 the villa, you know, has been there, but the garden is completely erased. And so uh, he, as a prompt, he asked everyone to address uh, the textual side of the history. And in this case, it was a... Um, it was a it was a garden uh, based on humanist principles. It was supposed to be an educational uh, kind of garden, which you know kind of dealt with classical themes of Roman antiquity, miniaturized on the site. Uh, and so, what we did was basically we were uh, I was reading a book uh, on the history of comedy. And it talked about comedic structure uh, related to uh, kind of uh, traditional rites, Roman rites, you know, having to do with a, a sequence of events that would happen that would go from, I think it was like a, um, a battle in, into a feast uh, related to the carnival, to the uh, Venetian carnival, of course, but earlier structure as well. So we took that as a, as a structure that allowed us to kind of spatialize the sequence on the site all over, all at once. Uh, and kind of following work that both Nanako and I had done in our thesis projects at you know, Cranbrook and at Cooper Union, respectively, uh, we began to kind of populate the site uh, you know, along the structure of the narrative. And that's uh, something that you still, uh, you're still doing, like um, using, for example, texts in order to order the ideas? Well, um, currently, uh, this is a project I didn't talk about in our current work, but we're actually very much involved in. Um, there was a, a project that was sparked by a fourth century Roman mosaic of a symposium. And I got really interested in the image of the symposium and what it could mean, especially given uh, what current sy symposia are like at Princeton and other kind of schools. Uh, and so it got me really interested in kind of returning to a lot of the materials that we had um, more or less kind sort of put aside at the end of the 80s. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I'm, we're looking, we, I've run a number of studios and we have a planned, um, uh, symposium probably sometime next year involving Sanford Quinter and Beatrice Colomina in Tokyo, 
where you know we're going to return to some of the themes that are uh, portrayed in the ancient mosaic. Of course, if you, as you know, I mean, the symposium is actually for the Greeks. It was a drinking party, quite literally, and it involved philosophical discussion. It involved, uh, you know, a lot of things uh, having to do with the kind of embodied experience and the mind. So, yeah, I mean, I think we've re returned to some of those old um, interests, uh, and so especially this past summer. Uh, we've uh, gotten involved in the design of uh, the actual space and also even the objects, uh, even the serving pieces that would be part of the meal and the discussion. The conceit here, uh, like kind of in a way in contrast to uh, the Greeks and the Romans, is that uh, instead of starting with a lofty subject, the design of the objects, and you know, I guess your sort of thing on monsters is absolutely appropriate here. Um, that the objects, the design objects themselves, would be literally conversation pieces, and they would spark more interesting and maybe even elevated con philosophical conversation. I don't know, but that's uh, what we're thinking about: is you know, approaching it as architects and designers and scenographers. We're going to the design elements of the, the, you know, the visual and the tactile and the experiential and how that would intersect thought and discussion. Well, uh, you, you used to say that it, you have a, like uh, these uh, meta projects, uh, like we, we talked in, in other, in other um, conversations. Um, when you are approaching a, a, a new design, a new competition, um, how much of the of the competition interests um, take part in the decision of the design? I mean, you're always thinking about something new, right? You, you, when you when in, even in some conversation you say that you were waiting for the next competition in order to try some new ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Uh, how much of, of the ideas that the agendas that you already have uh, mm -hmm. are involved in a project and how much of the agenda of the, the competition or the client uh, is part of, of this conversation? I don't know. I, I don't think we uh, purposely think about new ideas. It's more for the continuation of past work. But also we had to react to the new uh, requirement of the competition. So we had to think about how we can deal with site or any other issues that they're giving us. So the previous, uh, our work wasn't that much of the competition. So we had to come up with the whole, uh, side, the, with that side, we had to come up with a lot of ideas. But the competition, that's the work in the 80s. Basically, yeah, these are the work of eighty then. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, talking about what the, the work in the eighties, there is a lot of projects or, or design that uh, came from from that time that work with the idea of collage. Uh, this one in particular, the Venice Gateway. I believe that there is a lot of collage going on, um, but you can find this technique. Uh, Way later, also in projects like I don't know the, the Kansai National Library, mm -hmm. or even the University of Applied Arts of Vienna, where you find like um, continuous organizations. But at mm -hmm. some point, some objects appear, like in order to disrupt this continuity or to generate uh, I don't know mm -hmm. uh, this kind of breaks in the order. Um, is this technique? still going on do you think that it has evolved uh, and and what's the the what's the the original idea behind it i mean why do you start using the collage and how it has uh, in your opinion evolved uh, through mm -hmm. your work oh well, actually this project didn't start with collage uh, this uh, this is the uh, piazza di roma uh, in Venice, it's entrance point of Venice. Yeah. And 
so it's uh, mainly the project is the this is a really uh, interesting project we did and we really love it uh, but also there are a lot of invention happened here because before that we didn't think of this way but this one is incorporating the uh, circulation of buses circulation of people, circulation of buses, and also the each uh, vehicle, bus and pedestrian cars has a different uh, the maneuverability in the piazza. So we had to uh, we had to take that thing into the project. So these uh, forms came out of the fact of the uh, how the buses move here or a car can move here and how pedestrian can move here but also this offshoot of um the uh, you see these uh, what has it? tentacles had to go to the different island right yeah so this was a really fun project for us but also we learned a lot and then uh, this idea continues to other projects uh, yeah, I mean, to back up a little bit, there's an interesting context for this. The, um, we had begun a research project with Stan Allen, and Stan was involved in this project, by the way, in the competition, um, to analyze the, uh, the infrastructure of the water supply of New York State. It ended up being a massive uh, mapping project. And we were all having difficulty moving from, I guess, kind of analysis and mapping to doing a design proposal. And then Stan found this competition for the Venice Gateway and said, hey, why don't we, you know, kind of warm, get warm up by doing a competition? And it turned out that the competition was actually much more productive than the water project. We never really, um, you know, moved that much forward in terms of the design, but the uh, constraint, uh, you know, of, of time and the specificity of the project actually allowed us to pull together uh, in, the interest in infrastructure, which came from, you know, the water supply and the movement. Yes, collage, you know, did come into it. Um, but I, yeah, I mean, I guess I would say that it isn't just collage, that there were we were jung, juggling a number of balls at once. So one of them was about infrastructure and movement. The other was, you know, uh, one came from the legacy of working uh, volumetrically and formally, even from projects like the German house. And then, yeah, the use of collage, which, in a way, I mean, there's a volumetric set of operations, which one could argue are somewhat collaged. You look at this green model like you have on the screen. And then the other was quite literally about, you know, um, collage, putting collage, you know, mapping uh, material onto those volumes. More like rendering, frankly. Uh, it wasn't so much about, uh, I don't know, the use value of collage as the kind of sole driver for the design, but it, it kind of fell into the project more as a, almost a rendering technique. But yeah, well, I mean, there were, there were a, a bunch of concerns at once, that's all. And Nanako described the systemic side of it and the movement and all of the different groups that had to be addressed, you know. Well, uh, here in Nanako and um, watching to these plans and um, models uh, there's a lot of caution going on right like this idea of the infrastructure the the tentacles um, right. uh, if you if you show me this project and caution right one uh, after the other uh, mm -hmm. you won't you won't be able to say what came first you know uh, right. right that's pretty nice oh you know i mean it is also as much about the love of machines or using the you know infrastructure or the architecture like a big um, almost like the exhaust manifold on a 1960s Ferrari, <laughs> <laughs> something like that. Uh, you know, I mean, yeah. <laughs> all of those interests come into play. But then, you know, you, in answer to your question, I think you know you go to the site, 
if you don't go to the site with nothing, you, you know, an architectural project is most, I don't know, uh, valuable in a way in kind of bringing it to the constraints of the site and then having the site work on it. But you, it's not a matter of going to the site and getting everything from the site because you won't get much. So our right. technique in a way is to bring a model or a way of working you know, to the specifics of the site and the program. And then you know, it works on that model or we kind of think through the model in relationship to those uh, you know, specific things. But this one is uh, really, we loved this project and we learned a lot because, but how we did this was that we articulate each different vehicles of movement, taxi movement, buses are different, uh, tour buses are really different, but also we have to incorporate the movement of a uh, boat in the Venice. And then how we had to wrote the circulator people within this uh, the uh, infrastructure system. Uh, so the, the one thing we had to separate these issues, but also we had to learn how to combine these movements. So that was really interesting. And also that apply to lots of different projects in, in, the, in the future, like a build project, Kaohsiung or Taipei Music Center. There are a lot of issues uh, from this project. Well, uh, to to continue with the idea of the narrative, uh, I wanted to ask you about uh, your your uh, film references. I, I heard you a lot of times uh, mm -hmm. referring to um, Orson Welles movies, especially uh, Citizen Kane, or even. Uh, I, I remember you presenting some of the drastic shadows played in the third man in that um, that uh, uh, that, mm -hmm. that moment where the, the the guy is trying to escape. So uh, mm -hmm. is it, uh, is, is in the uh, how do you say it? like under the streets and the shadows plays mm -hmm. like some kind of rodnet uh, mm -hmm. shadows. I wanted to ask you um, how, how specifically these these ideas influence the work. If they are through the images, if they are through the the the, the sequences, the, the the narrative behind these these films, and is there other references to to pop culture that you may use in your work also? Um. Yeah, it's very hard to separate the strands out. But <laughs> I mean, I guess one of the things about this project, which um, we found really kind of interesting, which is really the interesting thing about uh, Vienna, uh, which I think was something that was already very present in the 19th century is that there would be a kind of public and kind of ceremonial neoclassical side to the way in which people kind of um, use the city and the cultural institutions so this is you know among the projects that's kind of arrayed on the ringstrasse in vienna and there's even a triumphal arch for entering into the angavanta or into the mac museum so I don't know, there's one reality, in other words, for the kind of formal use of the city. And then there's this other side, which is what happens in the courtyards, uh, which, you know, fortuitously, I don't know, relates almost to the unconscious. Like there's the kind of public Apollonian Venice, and then there's the kind of unconscious of Vienna which happens, you know, in these tight spaces. And I think we, we were, you know, you know uh, it wasn't entirely intentional, but I think it's, you know, it's there in Freud, it's there in, in, in the people who existed in that city uh, where there would be this kind of um, dialogue between, you know, the kind of public presentation and public display and the, you know, walking in the city and attending cultural institutions. And this one, 
which is a very peculiar one where, you know, you have um, the Academy of Fine Arts, which is a production place. And so I think we were really, it, it was also a kind of critique against making new uh, schools overly public or making the processes in schools um, completely transparent to visitors. Uh, that there would be a kind of formal time and place to show work. And that would happen in a, you know, uh, in this institution in a very specific way. But then there was also a kind of hidden production side where you wouldn't reveal the magic of production, of creation yet. It would, you know, that to maintain that kind of theatrical separation, even in the institution, uh, you know, related to the city and how the public uses it. Very much different, say, than you know the way Liz Diller was arguing for Lincoln Center, where you know she wanted to put uh, rehearsal on display or make to publicize the institution. We argued almost for a ninth kind of a revival of a nineteenth-century structure for the way in which institutions work in the city, and so the imagery. To get back to your question about the third man, I think plays with that you know that there is the, the dutch angles and the subjectivity the strange subjectivity happens in the courtyard where nothing is you know the horizon line isn't a given and gravity is defied in some way and the space is warped um yeah that form of expression we thought was really interesting to play with and, but yeah. this project, there are lots of things are happening. It will appear to be very simple, but each institution had to be separated, and same time had to be connected. So there, it, it is like a maze, like a space mm -hmm. we are creating. And if you take one path, you can only go to the school. And if you take another path, then you can go to library. Or you go to the main uh, staircase, then you go to the uh, the public right. uh, the cafes and the study areas, right. and also when you go to basement, and then you go to the theater. But also there's so many different um, connectivity is happening in these buildings. Yeah, well, it's, yeah, sort of a balance between making things really separate and distinct, and then other things being very connected. So the view you're showing right now. It is from like, what is it for the Oscar Oscar Kokoschka plots? So you're in a way it, there's something very classical too. I mean you're actually entering. This is the entrance for students and professors only, uh, and they pass under that oval form, which is the library. Uh, and the general public would enter from the Ringstrasse through the Triumphal Arch, and then they would go to they would have access to you know the um, uh, lecture halls and uh, final exhibition spaces or to the Mac Museum, but they wouldn't be allowed into the uh, place where the art is made or the thinking happens. Right. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, it was um, I think it was valuable for us in a way, not only to try to, um, I don't know, advance arguments about publicity, but also in a way to acknowledge uh, the value of cer keeping cer certain things distinct and you know, giving people time to work and not to be on public display. Right. But also at the, uh, the same time, the, uh, these, uh, the facade treatment uh, create a moray patterns in the buildings, which it give you some kind of illusion of the space. Yeah, I mean, we knew who um, we also knew who, who exactly which floor all of our colleagues were working on. This was an element, you know, coming off of the architecture school. Um, so we knew Hani Rashid was on this floor, and Wolf Pricks was on that floor, and Zaha was on that floor. It was um, a very personal, you know, kind of. Uh, project for us. I mean, it wasn't an abstract, um, you know, set of uh, users, let's say. Yeah. Okay. 
Well, uh, you mentioned the the atlas um, before, and uh, I was wondering um, when. Uh, I don't know if you have a precise idea of when uh, the the Lucian epistemology start mm -hmm. to. Uh, affect your work or influence your work. Uh, I, I can intuitively say that uh, it was like in the early 90s, uh, the, mm -hmm. the projects in the early 90s, but I don't know if, if you have an idea of, of when um, and why you started to uh, get involved with those ideas. Um, and the second question following that is, how do you think these ideas have affected not only your work today, but mm -hmm. uh, ar architecture expression in general. Is there some kind of legacy of all that effervescent ideas from the early 90s uh, that you find today? Well, I think you're right. You know, I mean, I think uh, though the influence of Deleuze, you know, came uh, through our interaction with colleagues, you know, at Columbia in the early period. So it would include, of course, you know, Stan and Greg Lynn, Stan Allen and Greg Lynn, um, but also, you know, figures like Jeffrey Kipnis and, and Sanford Quinter. And Sanford was probably, you know, was actually in Deleuze's uh, seminars. So he was more or less the direct sort of conduit to us um, regarding those ideas. And uh, I, uh, you know, personally reading the material was really excited because, I mean, I think this is true for a lot of the theory that kind of influenced us. We sort of already um, had some experience designing and, and working. And so it wasn't a matter of harnessing I don't know, the, the ideas of French uh, kind of post-structuralism uh, as a, an abstract concept, but it seemed to connect very strongly, especially with material design and material practices. Uh, like I was you know, trained in metalsmithing. And so, you know, Deleuze's articles, uh, you know, on nomadology and um, the logic of material transformation and social change uh, was already, in a way, you know, part of my equipment. Although, you know, I didn't, I wasn't able to articulate it that well, but it resonated uh, with me. So I was super excited. I, it resonated in a much stronger way for me than, say, Derrida, which was perhaps too abstract and too kind of purely linguistically oriented. Well, discursive, yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, that was, that was, it was great. You know, it was, it was a lot of fun and it was part of, of course, you know, uh, the scene at Columbia and the way we discussed work and projects and so forth. And how do you think this is, uh, this is still affecting your work? I mean, I know you, you have that, that background and, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, you, you, in a way, grow as a practice uh, intertwined with that, those ideas. Uh, mm -hmm. But do you, do you think that you're still going, going there in, in the search for, uh, I don't know, um, arguments, ideas, uh, concepts, designs in order to, to make uh, like consistency uh, with the work? Or do you think that is something that you are, you have already incorporated and uh, I, I think in a way, it's, it's, yeah, I mean, I'm not constantly going back to uh, uh, to Deleuze these days, but I think it's sort of, you know, probably could argue that it's, you know, part of our equipment is part of the way we, our attitude and the way we think and work. Um, and yeah, I mean, there are always are surprises too, you know, I mean, you made a comment about you know, this sort of uh, strange relationship between continuity and the discrete in the work. Yeah. And that was always there, I would say. I mean, we, um, 
but there were other influences too. I remember, you know, reading really interesting argument from Venturi about, you know, how does uh, Mies, uh, you know, would a Coke machine um, completely throw off or ruin a Mies building? It was almost like a reality test, like that there would be um, the possibility of inclusions even in a continuous space. Um, that would be kind of have nothing to do with that reality and that logic uh, that would nevertheless have to be there. So, right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's, um, okay. And, um, well, maybe talking a little bit about these, um, these meta projects that you, mm -hmm. uh, uh, presented in, in other, in other conversations, um, uh, you presented a series of, of these projects, um, but there were two that I believe they are still in the works. I think they are all still in the works uh, and they are all still influencing your work. Um, but I think that, that that they are moving in different directions. I, I am referring to, well, the RodNet project and the Surface project. Um, uh, isn't isn't is it some sort of synthesis uh, within these two projects? Uh, uh, yeah. Especially uh, since I don't know th these these two great projects of Kaohsiung and Taipei, where you can see like mm -hmm. uh, there's there's a source of synthesis. Um, but do you think that th there is 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 happening that maybe there is uh, building another? Uh, Agenda, another project uh, that is emerging from this one. I be, I think, I'm thinking, is there another project emerging from these two last big projects that you, mm -hmm. that you build? Really hard to say. I mean, I guess the first thing, which might have been covered in some of the writing, but, you know, both, yeah. I guess, the, you know, of course, the surface project pre existed our engagement with it. It was already underway, you know, from REM to FOA and all of those other figures, um, MVRDB, before we got involved in it. Of course, uh, like many architects, we got fascinated with it, but also saw shortcomings. But this, the RODNET um, was actually something that came about as the result of our collaboration with an engineer, uh, with Izzy Sinek. Because, yeah, I mean, it, uh, I got into, yeah, I mean, it may be a, an overly long story, but it was first suggested as a logic for dealing with um, the sway in the continuous building, uh, a purely pragmatic, you know, kind of solution for having, uh, you know, these very um, it started, complex slab surface right. project and then we yeah surface we like we, we came up with this uh, surface uh, organization of the slab which include all kinds of uh, program that's mainly library right the Kansai library we started right. but we didn't know how, we thought that can be a structural system and then we talk to an uh, engineer and he said, no, this doesn't support the building. So that he gave a suggestion that some grid system of hanging um, cable net from the roof, roof to the slab. Right. And then the perimeter rod net. Right. And then, so the structural system is only like a tool touching the ground. And others are hung by the ceiling. The, not the ceiling, it's the roof. By the structural roof. Yeah, yeah. roof. Yeah. But so a lot of those logics came out of suggestions by the structural engineer, and then we started to run with them. So to yeah, play with we, them. We start using a lot of as a logic, kind of try to kind of do every possible variation yeah. of that logic. Right. And so some of these ratnets working as a compression. But also other one is also working with intention. So each uh, project, we utilize this idea in each project in different way. 
or yeah, I mean, like the image you're showing right now of the uh, uh, the airport uh, really was the like the next iteration from the kind of shell tube structure of the O14 tower, turning it horizontal right. and adding more sectional variation. But it, yeah, it it you know came from uh, what I guess you would call it a design model, you know, that we kept exploring. Yeah, this idea of the diagrid maybe is, is is in a way like an integration of the surface and the and the road net, you may say. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. And it's something that you that you use different ways, even in this project that I really love that you don't show enough. Uh, it's a great project. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I said this is a great project. We enjoy doing this project. Yeah, yeah, I, I love this one. Um, I, I, I was wondering how this, because I, something that happens in your designs um, that is very beautiful is you, you can see them like completely different designs. You, you may uh, present them as uh, each one of them, like made by another studio. But if you go deeper, you will find these, uh, these like uh, hints where you can correlate them, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So this idea of the meta projects that you present, I found that it's like, uh, it's kind of uh, it's kind of hanging over the projects, but they it doesn't define them. You know, you, you can use them like in in a very various ways. So uh, mm -hmm. I was I was wondering this one uh, if there is a a project that you can like uh, relate to, like a meta project that you can relate to this one because I can see Kaoshun here. Uh, I can see the water gardens. Uh, there are a lot of projects going on, uh, but not explicitly. Like they are like implicitly behind them, right? Right. This one is, um, how do I say it? This one is essentially the, the surface project or also other structural system. We had to utilize that idea three dimensionally. So it became like overlapping the uh, the vertically is not a horizontal. Right. Right. I mean, it was also, you know, uh, the, we did take the program, you know, at face value, uh, you know, that the um, Adidas company wanted a certain number of, you know, kind of sub offices to be, uh, you know, connected. And so there was, you know, a kind of, um, a structure to their programming that allowed us or you know kind of pushed us in the direction of working with um, these multiple kind of overlapping surfaces with uh, but galleries also, overhanging right. galleries but also public this is the, also the gate of adidas comp compound so the public goes through this uh, the building but we had to separate the to circulation. distribute them, yeah, to the campus. So they yeah. can go into the building, but they can go through the uh, through the landscape on the ground level. And then, yeah, there yeah. was also yeah, the, there's that landscape on ground, and then there's a kind of uh, under belly uh, scape of the building of the uh, you know, that you walk under. Yeah, it's 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 very beautiful. Um, well, but you know, I mean, there's also you know, um, it, it, there were elements also in the culture, in the wider architectural culture, like you know, Agadir, for example. I mean, we have to. There are influences uh, on the project, which you know, uh, I would want to kind of point out too. I think this is you know the exciting thing about architecture, of course. Most of our contemporaries don't want to say it, but um, I think the exciting thing is that there are, you know, vital projects that aren't simply, you know, um, connected to one studio or one author, that cross author. So, you know, um, certain elements of this project would have been unthinkable without that precedent. 
Hi. Well, uh, moving on to the last uh, comment in this conversation, um, I would like to ask you about uh, well these two magnificent recent projects. Um, I, I was wondering because they were so close in date. Um, I know they they, are, they have been uh, 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 some years in, in the mm -hmm. working. Uh, in, I, I know that this project in particular, the Taipei, has suffered a lot of changes. Um, but I believe that they relate uh, not only in a formal way, but also in an organizational way. Um, mm -hmm. we, we talked about how Kaoshun relates to some of the of your early ideas um, uh, mm -hmm. about infrastructure and about geometry. Um, I don't know. Do you can you elaborate in in, in the way that they they relate with each other? Um, I mean, they they were developed uh, in similar moments, right? So right. they must right. share uh, some ideas regarding your agendas. Well, uh, I would say that the earlier the competition stage version of the music center, uh, you know, is much more closely tied to what finally was built in Kaohsiung. Um, yeah. But because of the yeah the programmatic changes, uh, you know the increase in the size of the main hall and all kinds of other, you know forces at work on the project, uh, it, most of that is, is gone. I would say from the uh, as built version of it. But I think we were also drawing from earlier you know interests as well. Not so much you know of course. Yeah, the competition version of this dealt with a trilobe theater, which in its beginnings goes all the way back to the uh, Cardiff Day Opera House competition. Uh, Zaha won that one. But we are, since then, we really wanted to do trilobe uh, building. So that when we won, when we got, that when we are invited to do this competition, we really brought that thing to the Taipei Music Center. But so that we tried to work out really hard, but it didn't work out well. Well, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean the um, the pop music people you know, who are then kind of running it didn't. Uh, I mean, probably quite rightly, didn't like the idea of um, three distinct uh, halls being fused together they wanted to have everyone in one big space yeah, they changed right. also they changed the program and yeah as i mentioned yeah, they, they made it much larger but yeah um yeah in, in a sense it was uh the, the early design it was much more infrastructural and has this mm -hmm. idea of, of this uh, tentacle monster right uh right. that you develop with caution uh right. but this way it is kind of I like it because it's it's kind of a collection of objects uh, uh, that are very intertwined. Nevertheless, uh, they're intertwined by the circus typology, uh, uh -huh. and and in a way, uh, geometrically, they, they they share a lot. So um, I think, in a way, it's maybe like and a, a not uh, not an explicit way to 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 connect. A collection of objects that relate uh right in the end right yeah i mean th this was i mean i guess the only kind of general uh, one general uh, kind of thing that would cross the two projects was an interest in kind of creating artificial grounds so you know these object right. buildings um like the main hall sits on a, a built ground which is more of the back of house functions of that theater and you know or, yeah, kind of internal uh, stuff, mechanics of the theater happen in the groundwork. And on the other side of the, of the road, you know, a similar idea about a fabric being a kind of ground for the objects that sit on them. Um, and in Kaohsiung, yeah, I mean, it's also, it's an edge project, but, you know, it, it goes back to even earlier work that we did uh, 
for the Hudson River, making proposals for the East River, uh, which is an edge project, an elevated esplanade, uh, which had, was infrastructural and mm -hmm. in scale yes. and efficient. I think I have it. Uh, let me see. I think you're referring to uh, this one, the Westlake well, conversion. To a certain extent, and even prior, right. I mean, this also oh. this is an elaboration, but even prior to that, there was a the um, development of edge. A 12 mile oh. development of the East River edge that the Van Allen okay. Institute funded. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that that's where, and this is a yeah, kind of a more detailed elaboration of that model uh, at, on the West side competition but yeah we kind of finally got to realize some of that in Kaohsiung mm -hmm. as a built reality yeah that that's incredible uh, that you that you will you, you you were able to to produce these uh these great ideas uh or, or at least uh, mm -hmm. a version of these ideas uh, mm -hmm. uh, and build them um I have one one last question, and then we can have some questions of, of the audience, um, if you like. Um, I was wondering if you may have a, an opinion, uh, a broadly opinion about this, um, these uh, projects that are being made of in China and Middle East, and Middle East uh, where international firms from all over the world um, take part into what seems to be some of the uh, more weirdest dreams of architecture from the 1960s and 70s. I, I'm referring to these uh, great um, uh, works that that are making in in some of the of Middle East uh, uh, mm -hmm. countries. Uh, how do you see these these works? Because uh, I don't know when I see the line, for example, or uh, these big uh, projects in China that are being developed, I, yeah. I, I feel like uh, like uh, some kind of encounter sensations, you may say, because it's great that these projects are being developed, but I, I don't know how are the how deep the discipline reaches are are going, you know. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But it's fascinating because some of the most uh, relevant, uh, you may say, uh, firms in the world are taking part in this. So I just wanted to know how, how yes. do you see this, uh, this like explosion from the last 10, 20 years? Well, it's, yeah, complicated, uh, you know, politically, <laughs> as well as, uh, you know, related to the disciplinary issues. Um, yeah, I mean, um, on the one hand, you know, uh, it's very exciting and you know for an architect or architects that there are countries willing to kind of do big projects like that uh it's almost you know an impossibility in the united states at this point um so on the one hand yeah the ambition and the excitement of uh, you know having opportunity to do it um is tempting and you know may lead to you know positive results but on the other hand uh you know i think you're right you know um uh, some of these projects can also be compromised because they're not you know fully worked through they're done you know um, in a very kind of detached and extended manner uh, you know um so yeah uh, i mean i could turn speaking from our own experiences you know both in Kaohsiung and, and, and Taipei um, we were very much hands-on you know I think we probably burned up our design fee but you know it was not something that you could sort of set and forget but I think a lot of these other larger projects uh, kind of also fall into a category of indifference you know like you the um, foreign architect will kind of come up with a huge utopian plan, uh, but they're either unwilling or unable, uh, you know, to kind of 
work in a very kind of careful and sustained and detailed way on those projects. So, yeah, it's complicated. I remember, you know, Stephen Hall saying to me that, you know, he can only expect about, I don't know, at best 70 percent in when he's doing a project in China. He's happy if he gets about 70 percent of what he wants. Right. You know, simply because that of the be that's enough, you know, that's a, all you can do. It's pretty good. Yeah. yeah. yeah I think yeah. we're touching the 90 percent <laughs> projects. Well, uh, but we also had very, you know, helpful and, you know, I, I would want to kind of put in, uh, you know, support for our executive architects were amazing, you know, Fei and Cheng, and we knew them well, you know, actually we taught uh, the second in command there at Columbia in the mid 90s. So there was a very close relationship and they really fought for these projects and right. did a lot of the political things that had to be done. That, you know. Yeah, I, I believe that in these big projects, uh, that's a very important thing to do, uh, to have the control in those stages. Yeah, it was uh, very personal. All the ones we've been involved in, for better or worse, have been very personal projects in terms of right. working with uh, the people. Yeah, and Dubai, not Dubai project. Dubai too, too. yeah. Not yeah. subjective personal, but more that there were very close personal relationships among the people, you know, to get a good project. That's great. That's great. Well, um, I believe that I am out of questions. Uh, we have a couple of questions uh, from Eddie Gordenberg uh, in the huh? YouTube chat. Yeah, he's asking, um, all through the 90s and the early 2000s, there was a pervasive discourse of emergence and bottom-up design strategies at Columbia too. Uh, how do you make design determinations in your own process? He asks. How, I'm sorry, I didn't catch the last bit. How do we... How do you make design determinations in your own process, taking into consideration these uh, bottom-up design strategies at Columbia? Well, I mean, I think, you know, in, in the reality of projects, it's... Uh, it's more a question of bridging, you know, um, bottom-up and top-down decision-making, some of which is not even your you know, decision to make. Um, right. So it's never going to be as, um, I don't know, closed or hermetic as self-generated, you know, um, purely bottom-up work. Um, yeah, I mean, um, there's also a kind of workflow which involves a kind of um, dialogue with the people who are, you know, represent the project. It's not, um, uh, you know, uh, it's not a linear process at all, but there's a real, uh, you know, an important back and forth. Um, right. Which, you know, I would say helps the project. Uh, so it isn't a you know case of pure authorship ever. Well, in a in a way, it, it, I believe that it could also function of, uh, as a restriction restriction to some of the uh, authorial uh, agendas that you may have. Mm -hmm. I, I mean. Um, it, it force you to confront to something that is external. Uh, right. So there are some uh, hierarchical decisions that you have to, uh, I believe, manage uh, and contrast. Sure. Uh, and also, yeah, I mean, you know, I think we come to it also not with the idea that there's one right solution. But yeah. that, you know, kind of draw on our resources from past work and for other people's work and it becomes a kind of dialogue and a synthesis of those things so it's as much about being receptive right in the way you work 
you know, as it is about, uh, you know, more so than, uh, I don't know, kind of a one way uh, process of authorship. It's a, that you have to be even receptive to the design itself. Right. It's not actually uh, about materializing an already formed concept. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I think uh, we, th there are all the questions. Um, I uh -huh. only, I only have to uh, thank you again. Uh, you know how much I admire your work. I believe that you are, uh, if not the most, one of the uh, most interesting uh, offices of today. Uh, I like the way that you integrate academia with uh, design and your uh, faith in competition uh, in architectural competitions uh, is something that amazes me and uh, I encourage anyone watching this video to to look forward for your work and to research about you um, thank you very much for doing this and I hope we can talk again soon Absolutely, Santiago. Thank you. I thank mean, for you. the opportunity, and you know, love your institution. We need more of this kind of discussion, and you know, uh, more connections uh, between our our uh, our spaces, as they say. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. See you thank soon. You. Bye bye. Bye.